get an idea of what we're dealing with, we can go to the book The God Kings and the Titans, James Bailey, New World Ascendancy in Ancient Times, St. Martin's Press, New York. Copyright 1973 by James Bailey, all rights reserved. For more information, write St. Martin's Press, blah, 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 New York. First published in the United States of America, 1973. On page 117, it states, approximately 1930 BC, the Amorites turned on the Sumerians in a conjunction with the Elamites destroyed them. The Amorites came from a region just to the east of the Phoenician ports, and it is reasonable to suppose that both peoples worked together. Manetho called the whole area Phoenicia. From their number came the invading dynasty known as the Hyksos, the shepherd kings who took over Egypt between 1700 and 1550 BC. They acquired their nickname not because of their humble origins, but because they governed their colonial peoples as if they were sheep. Of course, when we look at the Egyptian uh, symbology for what the pharaohs carried, similar to kings and other so-called hierarchical heads of authority today, we find the crook. This crook is shared as a shared symbol by the apparent clergy of today, which we see going around in various uniforms and whatnot. But they all carry this staff with the crook, just like the pharaohs allegedly of Egypt, or rather the Hyksos sheep uh, herding gods, kings, as described in that book. Then, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, dictionary.cambridge.org, crook is a very dishonest person, especially a criminal or a cheat. And so this is how we see the universalist global so-called ruling class of today, where they divide the females of the sheep, of course, in this context, they're talking about humans, from the males. So first you divide the females, and then you separate the rams, or the males, from the females, thus depriving them of their protection and ensuring that the uh, female sheep depend upon the crook of the shepherd, uh, which naturally takes the form of a ram's horn. Now the males are collected onto a stud farm, or at least the prime stock, as they would see it, of males are collected onto a stud farm. And they distinguish the studs, or the prime studs, with various accolades, trophies, ceremonial uh, recognition and things like that, whatever they deem to be the studs of the male populace. Same thing can be found with the so-called high intelligence quotient that they determine to be uh, the most desirable when it comes to the studs of the human population. These specimens that come from the studs are then collected and used to replace, essentially, to create more sheep while replacing the, or extracting it from the ram, but replacing the ram with the go-between of the shepherd carrying the crook. Of course, on the farm, animals such as sheep and whatnot carry brands or uh, trade marks symbol of their being owned by a particular sh uh, sheep or cattle farmer who will be the shepherd with the crook. Naturally, uh, sheep are fleeced, and synonyms for fleecing are extortion, gouging, cheating, overcharging, highway robbery, swindling, defrauding, chiseling, skinning, and chiseling is repeated again. We can get an example of this fleecing in a context to the human population. From the Hawkin County single audit for the year ended December 31st, 2021, and this is from Logan, Ohio. Here it states the county has pledged future sewer customer revenues, net of specified operating expenses to repay 2,700 uh, 
207,000, uh, pardon me, and 600, and 111,400 original issue amounts of 333,000 and 227,000. And sewer revenue bonds issued in 1996 and 1991, respectively. So, this is an example of how they fleece, they promise future revenue for the ability to get uh, bonds and things like that. And that's essentially like giving up the prospect of something as collateral. That is another way that we would look at a slave trade or a trade in workers. They're trading the work that will come from this uh, future revenue, which of course, naturally this is fraud, but considering that they're, they don't care, they're fleecing the people, right? They're fleecing their sheep. Another example of this fleecing, oper fleecing operation can be found in the General Code of the State of Ohio. Of course, there's many examples you can find all over the place. So this is uh, published in 1910, allegedly, published by the Commissioner of Public Printing of Ohio, which naturally is a corporate entity with designs on fleecing the sheep, as they see it, of Ohio. Here under collateral inheritances, it states all property within the jurisdiction of the state and any interests therein, jurisdiction is spoken oath, by the way, or in this case, I suppose it would be declared ownership, whether belonging to inhabitants of the state or not, and whether tangible or intangible, which passed by will or by the estate laws of this state or by deed, grant, sale, or gift made or intended to take effect in possession or enjoyment after the death of the grantor to a person in trust or otherwise, other than two or four of the use of the father, mother, husband, wife, brother, sister, niece, nephew, lineal descendant, adopted child, or person recognized as an adopted child and made legal heir under the provision of a statute of the state, or the lineal descendants thereof, or the lineal descendants of an adopted child, the wife or widow of a son, the husband of the daughter or a descendant, shall be liable to a tax of 5% of its value of a descendant. Uh, oh, uh... I just repeat that, shall be liable to a tax of 5% of its value above the sum of $200. 75% of such tax shall be for the use of the state and 25% for the use of the county wherein it is collected. All administrators, executors, and trustees, and any such grantee under conveyance made during the grantor's life shall be liable for all such taxes with lawful interest as here in after provided until they have been paid as herein after directed such taxes shall become due and payable immediately upon the death of the descendant and shall be at once become a lien upon the property and be and remain a lien until paid so apart from all the other implications of that section that is a direct example of how their fleecing operation, one of the mechanisms of their fleecing operation anyway, to take all that they hold a value from what they consider to be their sheep. Of course, the shepherds being the crooks, crook-carrying swindlers that many of us today call priests. Also, in the canon laws of the Vatican Code, or perhaps the Vatican Code is separate, but either way, it's, it's all the same crap anyway. Uh, it states... Customs presently in force, whether universal or particular, but against the prescriptions of these canons, if they are indeed expressly reprobated, are to be corrected as a corruption of the law, even if they are immemorial, nor are they permitted to revive in the future. Other customs, clearly centenary or immemorial, can be tolerated if ordinaries determine that, due to circumstances, person, or place, they cannot prudently re be removed. Other customs are considered suppressed unless the code, oh, yep, there it is, the Vatican Code, expressly provides otherwise. Also above it, 
It states other acquired rights and likewise privileges and indults granted by the apostolic seat to physical or moral persons up to this time. They are still in use and not revoked, remain intact unless they're expressly revoked by the Kansas Code. So there's a lot of things going on there. But the thing that we highlight here is the fact that they are determining that they are going to go in and revise any laws, even if they're immemorial, which are contrary to these laws, these false, illegitimate laws. That is a declaration of the usurpation, and treason, and essentially effecting war upon every single context of a sovereign authority across the planet. And this is, of course, to be carried out logically by the crook-carrying swindlers that go around in the name of this entity usurping and destroying every country in order for all things of value to be fleeced from what they consider to be their sheep. Naturally, one of the primary things that they need to keep an eye on, as it were, is the military. Thus, we have the Archdiocese for the Military Services, was created by Pope John Paul II in 1985 to provide the Catholic Church's full range of pastoral ministries and spiritual services to those of the United States Armed Forces. Pastoral, of course, being like a pasture in which sheep go and graze. The Archdiocese for the Military Services USA is a 501c3 organization with an IRS ruling year of 1946. Now, what could that possibly coincide with? And donations may or may not be tax deductible. Is this your nonprofit? Access the nonprofit portal, blah, blah, blah. Michigan Avenue, Washington, D.C. So, with that context established, go ahead and look at the Central Intelligence Agency National Foreign Assessment Center, 15 February 1980, rightist terrorism in El Salvador. And I'm sure many are going to notice some striking similarities between current elements in the United States over this decade, starting in 2020. Fearing that, well, I started before, but either way, a lot of elements will be evident starting from 2020 and moving onward to most people, I would say. Fearing that the governing junta will be unable to prevent a takeover by the revolutionary left, Rightists in El Salvador are stepping up violent actions. Their goal is to retaliate against the left and to encourage a right-wing coup. Sound familiar? Although our information on vigilante groups is sketchy, partly reflecting their history of fading in and out of existence, the involvement of security force personnel and members of the economic elite is widely accepted and substantiated by our own reporting. The principal rightist paramilitary organization, the White Warriors Union, it's a pretty weird name for a group in El Salvador, was formed in 1977. It focused its initial activities on the clergy, claiming responsibility for murdering a Jesuit priest in mid-1977 and threatening to kill all remaining Jesuits if they did not leave El Salvador by year's end. Last year, the organization killed another priest, and it, prob it probably was involved in dozens of additional boats unattributed murders of teachers, peasants, and leftist activists. The UCB published a communique last month threatening further action against the left. Alright, so before we move on to uh, the rest of this document, which there's one more paragraph, we should note that not only are the words they're using similar to current activities today, they love to implant labels, but they always frame things in a context where one of their groups is in control. Some group they control is in control, and they ignore who might actually be opposing them. However, the rest of these documents that we're going to look at are going to take a very strikingly different bent. So here they're stating the usual thing that they state, which is that there's a right versus left. Thing and it's one side or the other, and they're both extremists and crazy, and these people are the only ones that can keep them in check, as it were, 
anyway, the rest of this document states this memorandum was prepared by the Latin America Division of the Office of Political Analysis. The memorandum was requested by the Latin American representative of the National Security Council. It was uh, according, according, I'm not sure, Deputy Director of Operations and discussed with the National Intelligence Officer of Latin America. Information received through it February, 14 February 19 has been used in this report. So naturally, when you think about the crux who engage in fraud and uh, line in a uh, foreign military operation to take over domestically sovereign countries. None of this stuff can be believed, but you can definitely find a pattern in the documentation, which will not be very surprising. In continuation, in the past, suspicion of government involvement with the terrorist right was prompted by ex-president Romero's reluctance to speak out crack down against the EUGB. Naturally, there's a whole lot, large section that's been sanitized or revised, but as we would say, redacted, being the black spots. And naturally, there's going to be a lot of that going on with these documents, but in the context of most documentation books and otherwise, these people go in there and remove certain sections and then they'll in place their own section sort of copy and paste usually derived from their university mechanism of fraud and in that way they revise things and you can usually figure it out based off of the pattern but then you have to wonder what exactly were they trying to hide of course that'd be the question and naturally people that will go around and rewrite laws which don't agree with them it's no surprise that they have no issue with revising everything, sanitizing absolutely everything to keep control of their sheep. Anyway, a new group, the Organization for Liberation from Communism, OLC, which announced its formation last month and took credit for coup bombings may be linked to the former head of the Guard, who is known for his ultra-conservative views. Sound familiar? The OLC may have being responsible for killing a leader of a prominent leftist party that withdrew from the government in January. An active duty National Guard officer reportedly led the teams responsible for one of the recent bombings. Hardliners in the economic elite probably have provided personal funds, equipment, personnel funds, equipment, and organizing ability to the rightist cause. Boy, this stuff could have been copied and pasted for 2020, right? Next document is uh, apparently from Cuba, but in relation to the same concept. Ecumen Ecumenical Council condemns killing of Jesuits. Panama City, Akan, Spanish, blah, blah, blah. Archbishop comments on murder of priests. The Ecumenical Council of Cuba join in, joins in with all international institutions, right? All international institutions. Also, that's coming off Cuba. So you really know who's in control of Cuba and pretty much the entire globe at this point. And figures who have voiced their condemnation repudiating the killings of a Ignacio Alacoria. It's an interesting name, considering Curia is the, the Roman Curia, right? The... College of Cardinals, Rector of the Central American University based in El Salvador, Vice Rector Armando Lopez, four Jesuit priests and two domestic employees. In a statement released in Havana today, or Havana, the Ecumenical Council of Cuba asserted it is not difficult to see that the material authors of this terrible crime were instigated by the same ones who killed Archbishop Monsignor Arnulfo Romero. In the meantime, OAS Secretary General Joao Benya Suarez, not sure if that's Joao, seems like it would be Portuguese though, will arrive in El Salvador tomorrow to attempt to establish a dialogue between the forces in conflict in the Central American nation. And of course, they're always presenting themselves as the patient and kind shepherd, the person in the middle to lower tensions among the sheep. 
Baina Suarez stated to the press in Washington that his peace mission was a mandate of the OAS General Assembly in light of the worsening of the war between Salvadorian ultra-rightist government and the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front. Yes, of course, they love to give themselves mandates and go around executing those mandates when nobody requested them to. Other than themselves, of course. Naturally, the CIA are Jesuit foreign enemies of the peoples of the United States and the entire globe, but the CIA being allegedly a United States outfit is nothing but a foreign investment thug force whose designs are to cause instability and allow for a takeover and ruling of, uh, as they would say, appropriate ruling or competent ruling of their sheep. Now, most of this document has been redacted, naturally, or we could say revised. El Salvador assassination of Archbishop Romero, and then a lot of blank, and this is also hard to read. El Salvador, the assassination of Archbishop Rom Romero, influential public figure in El Salvador, could provide widespread violence and further uh, something government's chances of survival. So clearly the thing going on here, even though the elements or events happening are definitely being obfuscated and they're hiding a lot, is that the government of El Salvador, as they're claiming it, is not actually the government of El Salvador. In fact, it is a serious government of foreign interests with direct ties, naturally, to the Vatican and the Jesuits, as always. And they don't want their government being kicked out by the people and the reestablishment of legitimate domestic sovereign rule, as it would state the government by the people, for the people, right? Of course, in their context, they use the word people in a different manner to be direct people. Uh, I've done a lot of videos on that. <laughs> Either way, the it seems the people in El Salvador no longer want foreign oppression, as is the case today in most places around the globe. And these people naturally do not want to lose their ability to oppress and police the sheep. The killing, unquestionably, the uh, something of, of rightist, writing terrorists, is likely to provoke violent reprisals by the extreme left and could, uh, I'm not sure what that word is, say maybe truck, probably not, off a popular insurrection reaction to the assassination also may split the coalition government already weakened by dissension over the militants' failure to curb rightist violence, military. Regardless of guilt, the military will at least stand accused of having inspired the shooting and the U.S., because of a perceived association with the military, may also share the blame. The ultimate conservative opposition, something the feasible collapse of the ruling junta as a way to drive the civilization from the government and something a restoration of repressive military rule. So there you see their real goal, which is to undermine the authority and fighting capabilities, or as the Constitution would say, the security of free state, the military. All right, that's their primary objective here. And naturally, where they state the U.S., that's coming from the perspective of European, specifically Vatican, U.N., uh, etc., viewpoint. So they're they're also equally against the United States, the United States military, and the people. This is the CIA, <laughs> so-called Central Intelligence Agency of the United States here, right? More like the Central Intelligence Agency of the U of the Vatican operating uh, in the United States. Anyway, known as the champion of the poor, the Archbishop is, had seen the nation's most articulate critic of repression, and social injustice. 
boy, that doesn't sound like anything from 2020, and has recently stepped up his denunciations of violence by the security forces and the right. He also came close to endorsing the alliance of extremely le extreme left organizations of political alternative. What's interesting about this is that all the elements of the Vatican and this context, they're all on the side of the left, so-called left. Just like in 2020, where they're, they would pretend to be on the conservative, conservative right, but then they, of course, would naturally uh, be behind all the uh, woke social justice crap and uh, all the quote-unquote peaceful protesters going around burning things, apparently. But it is interesting how the clergy has always seemed to be on the quote conservative side, but they'll obviously be on the left or right side, it doesn't really matter, as long as they maintain control. They just want to be the middleman, the shepherds. And specifically, they need to remove the rams, in this case the military, mostly of fighting age males. And the same thing in the United States. All these little minions going around are committing treason, but they're, they're attempting to remove the fighting capabilities of the rams, as they see it. The rams being the male sheep. Without that removal, they can't take the place of the protective place of the ram, and also the ram will smash them to death with their giant hard horns. <laughs> yeah, that's um, <clears throat> got a uh, secondary meaning to it. <laughs> it's just a joke, though. Either way, it's true, though. They despise the military, and they have to undermine the fighting capabilities of the fighting uh, of the fighting age males because they're the ones who could physically oppose them. Now, most of this document is redacted, meaning revised by the people who go around and change domestic laws such as the U.S. Constitution. Uh, here in the bottom it says assertion that blah blah blah, Salvador are considering retaliation for the murder of Archbishop Romero, the nuns, and some Americans, probably the labor officials giving advice on agrarian. That sounds a lot like code enforcement today, going around and threatening and harassing people in a desire to destabilize the agrarian or agricultural component of the country and naturally set up these uh, caustic solar farms and all this other damaging stuff and then naturally get farmers to shut down their operations to create a fabricated shortage and the in this case, the code enforcement are in the front of that, and I suppose they had the same thing going on in Panama, but they were quote-unquote Americans, which is weird because, or El Salvador, because the area is, technically speaking, in the Americans, isn't it? Naturally, these, most of these documents are redacted, meaning they're covered in black markers or Sharpies or whatever, uh, and these people will sanitize everything, as I said before. It states is quite plausible, not sure what, but not really news, bunch of blank, order of Romero something, a goal of the Salvador something, till still counted by the Salvadorian people, nine murders was brought to very satisfactory conclusion. Even the nuns case where five National Guardsmen were tried and convicted for the their participation in the execution. Nobody believes that the individual or individuals who actually gave the orders either has been or will be brought to trial. In addition, certain factions, the insurgents, have taken responsibility for the assassination of 13, including six Americans in June 1985, and the kidnapping of Salvador and Duarte's daughter in the blah, blah, blah. Sounds like that crap with the uh, alleged plans to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Uh -huh. Perhaps the insurgents believe that a way to gather support for a cause Recent months has lost support of local Salvadorians, bring the justice murders of the Archbishop, blah, 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 Americans. So, yeah, they uh, are going after the military. They will have all their little implants in the upper echelon, which they always have for some reason. Usually bought through blackmail and other nonsense. Well, they'll have them set an example, and then they'll have one of their 
entities pretend to be doing something or other and they'll make up phony events that are going to happen and it's all designed to cause mayhem and to destabilize so that they can take control of everything and fleece the sheep. Now, in this next document, uh, 14 March 1989, El Salvador finds a special honor commission in the San Sebastian case. 9 March 1989, summary on 9 March 1989, the SAF Special Honor Commission, they always love their commissions and councils and all their other nonsense, they usually have the same people sitting on multiples, presented its findings in the San Sebastian case. According to the commission's report, Major Beltran, the 5th Brigade S-11 was primarily responsible for the 21 September 1988 killing of 10 civilians in San Sebastian. The killing of the 10 civilians who were in fact involved in FMLN subversive activities was a criminal act and was outside normal operating procedures. So this is going to be a frame-up job. Major Beltran concocted a false ambush to camouflage the killings and ordered the SAF personnel involved who opposed his orders to carry out the false ambush and kill the civilians. The commission found the commander of the 5th Brigade innocent of any knowledge regarding the killings and recommended that he be returned to his command. Yeah, well, that's because that guy's a traitor. The commission provided a list of persons involved in the killings who should be turned over to the competent tribunal for uh, legal action. Boy, that's... That is such a picture, carbon copy, perfect uh, example of the same crap happening today here in the United States. And it's all using the same language, right? Competent tribunals, something that's legal, something that's ordained by international interests, and of course, framing various military people and then having them executed and tried. Just as with the International Criminal Court's attempt to try and execute members of the United States military for actions in the Middle East at behest of, guess who? NATO, the UN, and the Vatican. Yeah, sounds about right. On 9 March 1989, the Special Honor Commission, uh, something of the armed forces, Salvadoran Armed Forces, SAF, presented its findings in the San Sebastian case. The Minister of Defense, according to the SHC's report, San Sebastian's killings were found to be the primary responsibility of Major Mauricio de Jesus Beltran Granados. No, Beltran is in uh, brackets there. That's kind of weird. The 5th Infantry Brigade, S11. The SHC also found that the 10 persons killed had been involved in subversive activities of the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, FMLN, but their killing was a criminal act. The SHC's report provided, provides as background to the findings of the story as originally put out by Major Beltran and the list of all the persons interviewed by the SHC. The report then provided a true account of the events based on the interviews and the something concluded the recommendations. Yeah, I had a doubt. Well, it's true according to them. Ha uh ha. -huh. Not really true, though. On 20 September 1988. Hmm. It's 20th September. Well, that's a particularly auspicious month, isn't it? Second section of the 2nd Company of the Kiboa Battalion of the 5th Infantry Brigade under the command of Lieutenant Arnold Antonio Vasquez Alvarenga which had been operating in the area for a number of days, received the order to capture a supposed insurgent named Jose, I think it's Maria, Martia, Flores, who resided in the town of San Francisco, San Sebastian jurisdiction. This mission was carried out and the captured insurgent was relieved of two M16 rifles, explosive propaganda, and two black uniforms, which he had in that place. At approximately 0730 hour local or 730 a.m. On 21 September, first Lieutenant Manuel de Jesus Galvez Galvez that's weird brackets in the repeat. Commander of the second company met up with the second section accompanied by his command group. He had received a report of the capture from his section commander. Based on the interrogation interrogation of the captured insurgent, three other suspected persons were detained while this was being carried out. An undetermined number, 30, 40, 30, 240 of people had been gathered in the street in front of the school, which led to the town of La Sebadia. Hmm. Sounds familiar. 
these persons have been gathered together so that the military could communicate them. The military is concerned that they were being used by the FMLN for terrorist dick purposes. Yeah, that sounds highly suspect and definitely didn't happen like that. I guarantee the military did not gather them there. I'm pretty sure they were just like all the ignorant college students and maybe less ignorant criminals that were all formed together in the Antifa BLM to be set up as uh, a sacrifice to the police UN thugs that we have running around today. At approximately 11.30 hours local on the day Major Beltran arrived in the scene, Beltran is the something 5th Brigade Beltran was accompanied by two interrogators, arrived by helicopter. As a result of the interrogations of the prisoners, six more persons were detained, making a total of ten. Between thirteen to fourteen hundred hours, local Major Beltran took the decision to kill the ten persons and was opposed in this decision by the two lieutenants who maintained his was an illegal order, which would compromise the military personnel. Hmm. I highly doubt any of that happened. It certainly didn't happen the way that they're saying it happened. They're trying to obviously frame this person that they clearly see as a threat to their position. And nobody, well, I mean, today they might say illegal order, but unlawful is generally speaking the term for it. Or um, illegal just means not written. <laughs> so from that nomination, I'm not, not sure what that word is. Major Beltran assumed command of the unit, began giving direct orders to subordinates. He ordered Sergeant Jorge Alberto Tobar Guzman to go along the road to La Sabadilla, set up an ambush using uh, captured equipment. Yeah, I, I doubt that. Sergeant Guzman, accompanied by some soldiers, established the ambush at approximately 1530 hours local. The civilians were led by various members of the troop to the selected location. A mine was exploded and a hand grenade was thrown, resulting in an undetermined number of dead, but the majority of the civilians wounded, who were then killed by members of the unit on the orders of Major Beltran. A poster and subversive propaganda were left in the place where the dead were to justify or simulate an insurgent ambush. The leg of the soldier was smeared with blood and he was evacuated to the brigade on the orders of Major Beltran. And that same helicopter was transported to the captured equipment with the exception of the explosives which were later destroyed. During the following days, Major Beltran spread the false version of events and ordered all subordinate personnel to stick to that story. In order to lend credence to his false version of events, Major Beltran selected a soldier wounded in another operation to present as a soldier allegedly wounded in the supposed ambush. This version of events is based on the spontaneous declaration made by the SHC by the military personnel who were present at the scene. Boy, we have seen so many of these same, almost exact carbon copy frame-up jobs done throughout history, but specifically and most recently in the United States. A lot of this stuff is just replication of the same playbook over and over and over again. But when you know it's false, and when you know you've seen it before, it's very easy to read these things and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what happened. <laughs> if, in fact, any of this stuff even did happen, this is such a classic false flag. From a conclusion, the events which took place on 21st September 1988 in the town of San Francisco, San Sebastian, San Vicente Department were not the result of insurgent ambush, but involved the responsibility of military personnel of the 5th Infantry Brigade. Of course, they need some fake bogus pretext to remove the fighting capabilities of the El Salvadorian military, just like with the United States. The 10 peasants detained at the time, who were subsequently killed according to the information obtained in the material captured, were involved in participating in an FMLN subversive activities. Primary responsibility is to say the decision and planning of the Criminal Act falls on Major Beltran. Also responsibility for the participation and exec execution of the events were Ten Arnaldo Vasquez Alvarenga, blah, blah, listen to names, and who knows what they did to be put on the... Uh, enemy list of the Vatican and the United Nations and all those other uh, crooks, crook, carrying crooks. <laughs> Although these persons could be charged legally, anybody can be charged legally. That's just a document in writing. Anyway, with the actions described above, this should not would not be justified as according to the information available in the SHC. At no time did they support the decisions taken by Major Beltran. Yeah, whatever. But on the contrary, opposed his orders within the limits of military hierarchy. 
Their actions can be explained by the damaging effects and the dynamic of this war and in the difficult balance between subordination to command and carrying out illegal orders. There we go again with that stupid word. The acts carried out constitute... Really? Constitute? A grave violation of the normal operating procedure which regulates the arrests made by personnel of various units of the armed forces. Uh, they would say the same crap today. Because they, according to themselves, are the law, and any laws that are not according to their law must be changed. And, of course, never be allowed to be resurrected. Right? From the Vatican Code. The commander of the 5th Brigade had no knowledge at any time of the reality of the events until his interview at the, by this commission. These kinds of actions, which by their nature are isolated to and attributable to the persons who carried them out, are unjustifiably prejudicial to the institution as a whole and affect the achievements made by the military in recent years in the areas of professionalism and respect for human rights. Boy, so many buzzwords. They do, however, indicate the need for a review of military policy in these matters in order to renew efforts and to reach the highest possible levels of professional and res professionalism and respect for human rights. You mean, put the whole mechanism under their control to eventually be done away with, of course, and to have just overt declaration by their own people so that they can shepherd the sheep. Recommendations that the persons indicated herein be put at the disposal of the competent tribunals. There you go with that word again, competent tribunals, like competent authority. That's another word from the Vatican. So that responsibility can be established in conformity with the law. Right, because only their law exists and anything that's not their law has to be revised and completely removed and made sure that it will never be resurrected. That in the periodical review of the institutional policy regarding professionalism and respect for human rights, well, it's three times they've repeated the same crap, new concrete measures to study a recommendation of which are beyond the purview of this commission be evaluated and established promptly. Yeah. Because that's something the Vatican has to do and then give orders to their crook carrying crooks that are embedded to cause mayhem and to destabilize and take over and fleece the sheep. That the commander of the 5th Brigade be immediately restored to his command and the personnel not mentioned above be returned to their military duties once they have accomplished the judicial duties which require their presence. Hmm. That's interesting. That last bit there. And then there's, of course, there's a lot that's been redacted. That is no surprise. El Salvador, National Police Role in the Investigation of the Murders of Six Jesuit Priests at the University of Central America. Hmm. They were at the university. Interesting. So, that puts the university under the protection of the Vatican. No surprise. Or all the different international units that act as the front for the Vatican. Context. In mid-December 1989, large blank, so the National Police received orders from the presidential household to conduct a complete and honest investigation uh, yeah, honest, of the murders of six Jesuit priests who had two other persons, which occurred on 16th November 1989 at the Central American University, UCA. Hmm. That'd be Universidad Central Americana, so that would be accurate acronym to Spanish. Said senior police officials, in turn, ordered the National Police Detective Division to conduct a preliminary investigation of the murders and provide all necessary support for the Special Investigations Unit SIU investigation. And then there's a blank. Senior police officials are committed to sol solving the murders and bringing the guilty parties to justice, whether they're from the political right or left or the military. That's their target right there is the military. The national police role has consisted of providing technical support to the SIU, including ballistic comparisons, fingerprint work, and routine investigation procedures. Then there's a blank. The national police also conducted a preliminary investigation, which failed to turn up any physical evidence. The information gathered by the national police investigation corresponded with that obtained by the SIU. And that's a problem for them. They need some physical evidence to be discovered. The area surrounding the UCA campus was under the control of Salvadoran Armed Forces, SAF, and Security Forces personnel. There was no guerrilla activity reported in the immediate area around the UCA on the night of the murders, and there was no abandoned or stolen vehicles left in the area to provide clues as to the authors of the crime. 
Blake expressed his opinion that the SAF was involved in the murders. He said he based this opinion on the fact that there was apparently no grill activity in the immediate area around the priest's residence prior to the murders and that there was a heavy military presence in the area. Hmm. So the priest has a residence at the university. What a surprise. He added, however, that while many in the National Police suspect SAF participation in the murder, no proof exists to implicate the military in the crime. So they need to make that proof, right? A uh, bunch of blanks here. Anyway, Blank served for a number of years in El Salvador and maintains close relations with senior officers. In early August 1990, he visited San Salvador, where he met with Minister of Defense Larios and Chief of Staff Ponce. One of the subjects discussed was the killing of the Jesuits last year. Blank said that Larios told him that he did not know who killed the priest, but believed it was Colonel Benavides. Larios said that there was no evidence, however. Larios did say that neither he nor Ponce had given the order for the murders. And then there's a bunch of blanks there. So I think we all know what's going on here. And this page has a bunch of blanks here. El Salvador discussing among supporters of Roberto de Abuisson of plans to assassinate President Cristiani and other political figures early August 1990. Text 1. As of early August 1990, Nationalist Republican Alliance, ARENA, party members close to Roberto de Abuisson were discussing ways to assassinate President Alfredo Cristiani, his closest personal advisors and selected cabinet ministers, one possibility discussed was assassinating Cristiani and his close associates at a social event. According to this plan, Cristiani, his advisors, and selected cabinet members would be invited to an important social event which would be controlled by De Abuisson loyalists. During the course of the event, De Abuisson loyalists would kill their intended target and escape. Two, a second possibility discussed involved killing Cristiani and his associates during a Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front FMLN offensive. De Abuisson loyalists believe that should another FML MLN offensive occur, it would be a perfect opportunity to assassinate Cristiani and his advisors according to this plan. The yeah, we saw loyalists could assassinate their intent targets using the confusion of an FMLN offensive as concealment of the act. The assassinations would subsequently be blamed on the FMLN. The day we saw loyalists compared this plan to the alleged military killing of the Jesuit priests on 15 November 1989, with the exception that the day we saw loyalists are confident their involvement would not be discovered. This second one here and also all of these things <clears throat> are not really being discussed they're more like conjecture of what the bad people think will happen to them for their crimes because there's really only one way they're going to be held accountable in this context the second one sounds a lot like what is being alleged to take place soon when a second uh peaceful protest is set up across the country, which would provide cover for the elimination of the true heads of these criminal uh, foreign insurrections going uh, around. And that's one thing they're worried about, being taken out by people during one of their uh, events that they've planned, so that their events they've planned gives them cover because they're weakened, the weakened state being focused and using resources on their uh, established activity and naturally they're worried about getting taken out during the process of things by any number of detached actors which they would all group into the quote-unquote extreme right which of course is what they're doing here but all as a way to provide pretext to undermine and destroy the fight capabilities and the sovereignty of an to them, anyway, an enemy nation. Anyway, there are increasing indications that Dab we saw is frustrated over his inability to penetrate the presidential offices due to the virtual blockade presented by Christianity's inner circle. Dab we saw's loyalists within arena are probably reacting to Dab we saw's outward manifestation of this frustration and have begun to discuss means by which they can eliminate the source of Dab we saw's problems. And there you get the writer providing conjecture. That's confirming what I said before, which is that this never happened. This is simply them thinking about what might happen to them, how their plans might be thwarted. Anyway, uh, Dabby's not loyalist within blah, blah, blah. 
i.e. Christiani, his advisors, and selected cabinet ministers of uh, IT shall also be kept in mind that many of Dabley Sons loyalists are politically unsophisticated. Well, there's a put down right there. And quick to resort to violence to remedy their problems, which makes them all the more dangerous. Yeah, right. That's exactly what uh, these people do. They uh, resort to violence, but violence of mass mayhem and rampant destruction and chaos. That's uh, their first resort. And here we go with another one. El Salvador consideration by army officers of mounting an assassination attempt against San Salvador Auxiliary Bishop Gregorio Rosa Chavez. Uh, and then this bunch. Forces, S-E-E-S-A-F, officers are discussing plans to assassinate the Auxiliary Bishop of San Salvador Gregorio Rosa, Rosa Chavez. And I don't know what's up with these brackets. The officers are considering this plan in the event SAF Colonel Guillermo Benavidez, currently in prison for allegedly ordering the county of six Jesuit priests and their housekeepers in November 1989, not released from prison. The officers believe that by assassinating Rosa Chavez, government prosecutors can be led to believe that the murderers of the Jesuits are still at large and that since Benavidez cannot have participated in the assassination of Rosa Chavez, he probably is therefore not involved in the Jesuit killings. Yeah, this doesn't sound true at all. The officers have begun to collect information on Rosa Chavez's residence, schedule, movement, and vehicle. This possible plan is in its earliest stage. No information has yet been gathered on Rosa Chavez, and no concrete plans formulated to carry out an attack against him. Like the Jesuits, Rosa Chavez is viewed by enlightened elements of the extreme right as an apologist for the FMLN, if not an outright FMLN collaborator. This makes his selection as a target for the incipient and bizarre plot outlined above a logical one from the perspective of the plotters, Rosa Chavez, his two brothers, and our FMLN military commanders. Ambassador's comment, while the above must be taken seriously, a junior officer describing plotting of this nature by an unknown number of officers at undefined levels of the officer corps leaves important questions unanswered. At this point, we could be dealing with nothing more than two, three junior officers relieving their frustration with damage done to their institution by the Jesuit case. That's full and incredibly stupid wishful thinking that the problem can be dealt with. Huh. Wow, yeah. They are so contemptuous. <laughs> Fantastic. It is difficult, but not impossible, to believe that officers of rank or experience would conclude that implementing such a scheme would alleviate pressure on the SAF, ESAF. On the other hand, why would a group of junior officers go to such lengths to free Colonel Benavides, senior officer who must junior officers feels has brought the problem down on them? Yeah. God. These people are a lot of blanks here. Two plus items are R.E. the Jesuit murders. Blank told that he was visited by Lieutenant Colonel Camilo Hernandez while the latter was still under detention. Blake Hernandez said that if the pressure on him continues, he would finger Colonel Rene Emilio Ponce per blank. The exact phrase used by Hernandez was, Si me sigan arretando voy a poner el dedo a Ponce. Yeah, I highly doubt that. That's Spanish for if they keep... Uh, following or, or keep um, pressuring me, right? Uh, I'll put the finger at Ponce, which is the same thing, but it doesn't sound like something that you would say uh, at the time period in the Spanish used. Hernando was set free shortly thereafter. Blank told that he knows who gave an AK-47 to Hernandez, which was used in the blank. Blank University the night of the Jesuit murders. Blank did not identify to blank who this person is. Blank spent rounds from an AK-47, which is not military issue, were found at the murder scene. Blank, blank, blank. Now, of course, <clears throat> this naturally follows the same course as other events in history, specifically the events in Japan in relation to you-know-who. The Great Ship from Amicon, Annals of Macau, at the Old Japan Trade, 1555-2040. Centro de Estudos Históricos Ultramarinos, or Center of Historical Ultramarine Studies, Lisboa, or Lisbon, 1959. Here it states, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, taking particular excerpts that will narrow down the elements so that we can understand them in context. Uh, Bugio is a fiscal residence where they're joined by Vasco Paglia de G. Almeida and four of the principal Portuguese from the recently arrived Galios 
Ota Bichu no Kami then made his appearance and addressed them peremptorily through the interpreter as follows. 1. You and your compatriots have continued to bring missionaries into the country despite the stringent laws against this practice. So this is what happens when you give them three warnings over many periods to leave. They never leave because according to them, they own your land, they own you, and they own everything that you own because you're a sheep and they're your shepherd or your cook. Two, these missionaries and their converts have continually received aid and comfort from you and your compatriots to help them accomplish their designs. Three, this has resulted in many of our vassals forsaking their bounden duty and thus caused the death of many. For all these reasons, you people are all worthy of death. His Imperial Majesty should justly kill you. But he has condescended to spare your lives and hereby ordains that you should leave Japan and never return. If you should subsequently break this command, you will then ineffably be punished as you now deserve to be. Now, fortunately, Japan had an opportunity here that they did not seize, which could possibly have, in some ways, benefited future, benefit future generations. I don't believe that they really quite knew to the extent what was going on here and what opportunity they have. The example of giving multiple warnings to these people and they just ignore them tells you that this is way too lenient for these people. So, the contemporary Dutch narrator of these events, 349, who undoubtedly derived his information from Japanese officials who were present on this memorable occasion adds, the Portuguese answered with tears running down their cheeks, whatever his imperial majesty wishes shall be done, but our sorrow compels us to tell your highness that we would beg you to punish the breakers of the Japanese law with death and to allow the innocent among us, ones among us, to continue this trade. For Macau gets nourishment from Japan, and if we are deprived of this trade, we will all relapse into utmost destitution. That is the classic tactic of criminals. When they get caught, they plead and they cry and they whine and they pretend to be victims. They never, ever, ever, ever face up to the justice of their crimes, ever. And just like a normal bully of what people understand to be bullies, as soon as they get caught for what they're doing, they always play the victim. And that's the same thing going on here. They had far enough uh, um, uh, far enough uh, warnings, as it were, and they ignored all of them. And just like that uh, guy said, they deserve they deserve death, right? And they should have been killed, all of them. But they weren't. And we're paying for it today. And naturally, this answer was ignored because they knew exactly what it was. And it's the same today. When you out these people, they decry victim, they decry persecution, they say, where's all this anti-Catholic sentiment coming from? Or, where is the anti-Semitic sentiment coming from? Yeah, has nothing to do with that. It has entirely to do with criminal enemy foreign investment operations to destroy everything, basically. So the ultimate outcome, uh, some, some small piece of justice, I guess we could see it in this single incident, which hasn't appeared to have taken place uh, for many years since and naturally required uh, repercussions for the Japanese in the forms of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The commissioners accompanied by as many executioners as there were victims to be beheaded made a record journey between Yedo and Nagasaki being only 10 days on the road. Within a few hours of their arrival, they summoned the Portuguese to an audience. The latter, unwittingly thinking that a favorable answer was going to be returned to their petition, dressed themselves in their gala clothes and appeared before the commissioners in good spirits. But, wrote Francois Caron in his graphic account of the ensuing tragedy, poor wretches, the matter went quite otherwise than they had expected, for they were addressed by the principal commissioner as follows. You villains, you have been forbidden ever to return to Japan on pain of death, and have disobeyed that command. Last year you were guilty of death, but mercifully were granted your lives. Hence you have earned this time nothing but the most painful death, but since you have come without merchandise and only to beg for something, this sense is commuted to an easy death.
The Portuguese were then uh, trussed like turkeys and thrown into jail for the night, which they passed in weeping and wailing according to the Dutch account, or in prayer and thanksgiving according to the survivors. That's their classic line and rewriting of history. That's an example there. They saying that it was, oh yeah, they were piously accepted. <laughs> yeah, right. So in a different part, it states that Unfortunately for him, his arrival at Yeddo coincided with the outbreak of the Shimabara Rebellion, when persecuted peasantry, there you go with that word peasant, which they use as a derogatory term, just like slave or worker, which are all synonyms of one another, and crypto-Christians of Arima and Amakusa, or trade worker, the tra slave trade, worker trade, all right. Sound similar. Anyway, Arima and Amakusa rose against their feudal oppressors in one of the bloodiest and most famous episodes in Japanese history. The rebels used the Iberian war cry Santiago, St. James, and burnt Buddhist and Shinto temples wherever they found them. So the authorities naturally suspected that the movement was either inspired or supported by both the Portuguese. Or both by the Portuguese. The shogun Roju, or Great Council, hesitated whether to receive Don Francisco de Castel Branco. They finally compromised by accepting the presents he brought on the 6th of February 1638, but declined to receive him in person. <laughs>